one, a special programme from Crime Watch. Armed robbers think they can get away with anything. But do we have news for them? Armed readers have carried out the biggest but robbery fallen in British prey history. to a gang that police have described as callous and who planned a military-style operation. It becomes a game of cat and mouse where each side is looking to be one step ahead of the other. More than £40 million pounds worth Straight of Straight out of a film stolen. script, armed police have foiled what would have been the biggest robbery anywhere in the world. Some criminals dedicate their lives to outsmarting the police, risking it all in the pursuit of other people's money. The creed of the armed robbery is normally spend it fast, because if you get nicked, they'll only take it back. Whether through meticulous planning, brazen audacity, or sheer brute force. The gang behind the raid were armed and dangerous. They planned an armed robbery, almost like perhaps the police would plan a policing operation. Gang members disguised as police officers in what we appeared thought, to be well, that's a bit vehicle. mission impossible. So stealing 53 million quid. Guided by some of the country's leading detectives, and criminal psychologists, as well as the unique insight of an ex-armed robber. We examine how investigators stay one step ahead of some of the most professional criminals. The challenge laid down is simple. Catch me if you can. Armed robbers are among the most dangerous and volatile of criminals. And few understand the risks they pose better than those tasked with bringing them to justice. History is littered with instances where there have been firefights because, in, because armed robbers had loaded firearms and when compromised, used them. In a career spanning 34 years, Barry Phillips has put some of the UK's most vicious crooks behind bars. The principles of a good detective in the investigation of armed robbery have not changed. It's a seasoned detective, somebody who is a proven thief taker, somebody who has the ability to generate information, identify leads, sometimes on hunches, which is vital in the world of armed robbery. And for most thieves, cash is still the prime target. We would rob anywhere where there was money. There were certain places that a lot of robbers won't touch. I mean, you get to know, once you've been in the game for a while, you get to know who's going to hand over and who isn't. Reformed career criminal Noel Razor Smith was once dubbed Britain's most dangerous armed robber. He's carried out over 200 raids and spent more than 30 years behind bars. You've got to be very greedy and very lazy. You don't want to work for a living, you want everything now. Where's the money? You don't want to save up for a car and get it next year, you want it tomorrow. The creed of the armed robber is normally spend it fast, because if you get nicked, they'll only take it back. But while their goal is simple, the organisation and planning of some of these crooks means the detective's work is far from straightforward. To catch them, police must first penetrate the close-knit teams they operate within. They will be individuals who went to school together, they lived on the same estate in the same area. They will not work with people outside of that small, close-knit circle. And for these outfits, complete trust is vital. You've got to get to know people, judge their personalities and their characters before you'll actually go to work with them, because if you don't, you're going to get nicked. But some of the most effective teams aren't complete until they've recruited perhaps their most important member. The inside man. The inside man allows a gang access to the inner workings of their target and can expose vital weaknesses. When you're planning to rob somewhere, you're looking for inside information if you can get it. It's always handy to have. In 2004, NatWest Bank employee Shazim Jusab committed the ultimate betrayal. 
Seduced by the promise of quick cash, he turned against his colleagues. Good morning, mate. Jump in. You all right? Yeah, fine, thanks. And joined forces with a team of violent armed criminals. No, what you no. Having supplied them with the crucial inner workings of the bank, Shazim heartlessly looked on as the robbers kidnapped his colleague at gunpoint. He then played the innocent victim as he was ordered to empty the safe of £200,000. Shazim had acted his part convincingly, earning himself a share of the stolen cash. And at first, no one suspected a thing. Until detectives identified two of the armed robbers as Shazim's relatives, and his story began to unravel. Under police questioning, he quickly admitted his role in the robbery. But now he tried to pin all the blame on his own brother-in-law. He was the one who started the discussion. He said, I want to rob NapWest Bank Russia. He came to a point when I said to him, there is no way I'm going to let you rob the bank. He stopped, he told me, listen, you have it my way or the highway. But this time, no one was fooled by Shazim's performance and he was duly sentenced to 12 years for his role as the inside man. But it's not just the villains who rely on inside information. In any robbery gang, there will always be a weak link. The bigger the team, the more weaker links there will be. If you can identify those individuals, a detective will look to turn them into sources of information. These individuals are known as covert human intelligence sources. In other words, informants. They still play an important role in the combating of armed robbery. They provide information that will either identify an individual or a gang. They may well give you information of their intended target. The most valuable sources will go beyond just passing on information. They'll go on the record and give evidence and become the highly prized supergrass. In 2002, there was a serious epidemic of armed criminality in and around Heathrow Airport. Robberies at warehouses and lorry hijackings were being committed by around 300 criminals that lived in the area. To catch the ringleaders, Scotland Yard's elite flying squad needed information. The first big breakthrough was when a baggage handler was arrested and came forward as a supergrass. Oh, the guys you need to be looking for, they all live in the Stanwell area, so they know the airport like the back of their hand. It's all very well. What we need is names. The key name that came through was a man by the name of John Beach. John Beach is the guy you need to be looking for. Beach worked as a van driver near Heathrow, and he was immediately put under surveillance. With this lead, the police quickly began to infiltrate Beach's criminal network, and soon discovered they were working up another job. We realized that they were planning something, but we just could not identify the premises, and we needed to establish exactly where it was gonna be. Phone bills you asked me to look at. After studying Beach's itemized phone bills, Detectives spotted something suspicious. Reoccurring throughout the bill. He was in regular contact with someone who worked at the Swiss port cargo depot just outside Heathrow. We then discovered that there were regular, highly valuable consignments going into the Swiss port depot, like large amounts of cash and also gold. The team concluded that Beach's Swiss port contact might be helping the gang to set up the raid. The flying squad started planning an ambush to catch them red-handed. Delivery comes through here, through the main gates. Their tactics needed to be perfect. Just inside. If Beach's inside man got wind of the investigation, the entire police operation would be compromised. But they were still missing details on when it would happen. Five days. Then the team made a vital discovery. But this is the most interesting bit. The this depot was due to receive an enormous delivery of cash and gold the following Monday, worth around 80 million pounds. I've got this little job coming up. You interested? If the gang was successful, it would be the biggest robbery the country had ever seen. We had a 
had over 100 officers deployed in and around Heathrow Airport. I was positioned just outside the depot, watching what was happening. Nothing to report, boss. By 9am, the cash had been delivered to the warehouse, and the security van carrying more than three tonnes of gold was on the way. You got visual? But how the gang were going to commit the crime remained a mystery. The arrival of a white van a few minutes later looked perfectly innocent. But unknown to police, the driver had used forged paperwork to pass through security, and in the back was the armed gang. Hey there, boys. You ready for this, yeah? The robbers were in the car park in their van. What they didn't know was just metres away, in another van, was my team of armed officers. The irony was that neither of them knew either were there. The two groups of men waited. The police for the robbers to strike. The robbers for the gold to be unloaded. For their plan to work, the insider had to tell them precisely when the gold was on the warehouse floor. It's here. It's on the ground, yeah? Yeah. And when the vault door was open. All right, boys, this is it. All done. Come on. What happened next stunned the police. <laughs> Immediately, the robbers got out from the back of the van. Some of them went straight for the gold and started to load it onto the van. Others went into the vault area where they threatened the custodian to get his keys to get to the cash. We're in a cash bag! Open the door! Do it now! I realised that this was it. Attack, attack, attack! Go, go, go! We immediately deployed the firearms officers. Police, get down! Minutes after the armed officers went into the warehouse, I walked in. Job well done. It was a moment of elation. We knew that these men were going to go away for a long time once convicted. Hello. And although their ringleader, John Beach, had tried to keep his hands clean by not taking part in the actual heist, he was jailed along with the other gang members for a total of 83 years. Both the criminals and the detectives had relied on inside information. But this time, the police had come out on top. Unlike most investigations which start after a crime has taken place, the ultimate aim for detectives dealing with armed robbers is to catch them in the act. Police, show me hands. Show me hands. It's vital to wait until that last second before they commit the robbery with the guns in their hands so you maximise the evidence that goes before a jury. It's highly specialised policing, with units up and down the country dedicated to catching the criminals who claim they have the highest status of all. There is a definite pecking order in crime, and armed robbers are, are kind of classed as the elite. They sit right at the top. You've got a whole special squad of police who are just there to catch armed robbers. So that makes you feel special straight away. Because you're not going to be caught by a run of the mill plot. You're going to have a, a specialist squad after you because of what you've done. From the great train robbery to the Brinks Matt Gold bullion heist, generations have grown up with audacious rage that have set these criminals apart. The armed robbery really catches people's imagination at its most elite, at its most sophisticated. Um, it defies uh, everyday life. Professor Dick Hobbs has studied organised crime in the UK for nearly 30 years. As a leading expert in armed robbery, he is well aware of the myth it has created. It's a crime that people are fascinated with because anyone can walk past the bank or past the security van and uh, see the money coming in and see the money going out and just wonder what it would be like to have that little edge, to have that ability or that willingness to take that money by force rather than to do a nine to five. It really is grabbing a fortune 
in a minute. Part of the fascination lies with the sheer audacity of some of these crimes. Every now and then, someone will come along with a methodology which actually does show a certain amount of wit and imagination. And for the minority of armed robbers that can actually do that, they still can be regarded as being very much, the, if you like, the cream of the crop. In a remarkable 2009 raid, a sophisticated armed gang stole a helicopter and landed it on the roof of a cash depot in the Swedish capital, Stockholm. Launching their commando-style attack, they smashed through windows and detonated explosives to blast through security blocks. They seized 39 million Swedish kroner, just under four million pounds, in little more than 20 minutes. And to ensure their escape, the gang placed a fake bomb in the police helicopter hangar, leaving them stranded on the ground, watching helplessly as the robbers disappeared into the night sky. The whole scene around armed robbery is a sort of self-perpetuated myth. It's come from maybe 60, 70 years of Hollywood films and television programs that kind of glamorize armed robbers in the way that they don't glamorize other criminals. What it really boils down to is you're a thief with a gun. 24-year-old local man was The shop shot. assistant feared for his life. The postmaster was taken to hospital with facial injuries after the raid. Behind any apparent glamour and fictional hype, one aspect of armed robbery goes largely forgotten. The victims. It's always said that armed robbery is a victimless crime, that all they're robbing is a commercial premises where the money can be regained through insurance companies. That couldn't be further from the truth. Once I actually sat down and thought about the things I've done, I was quite ashamed and embarrassed by it. And, you know, I did realise that people had been hurt. I classed myself as a sort of happy-go-lucky Robin Hood kind of figure, when really, in reality, I was just a scumbag criminal frightening the life out of people in order to nick a few quid because I was too lazy to work. And the most brutal of these criminals will go to any lengths for even the smallest amounts of cash. A policewoman is shot dead responding to an armed robbery in Bradford city centre. Police named the dead officer as Sharon Beshenivsky, a mother to five children. The generation that have grown up now, their heroes are Colombian drug barons and American street gangs where violence is the thing, not the actual getting of money. It's all about getting power. And to do that, you have to be more violent and vicious than the next man. Life has become cheap. I know it's a cliche, but it has. It's become cheap. As the stakes are raised, it's not just the police who are fighting back against these armed villains. In 2006, there was a huge increase in cash in transit robberies across the UK. But those responsible for these attacks were a new breed of armed criminal. They were very much younger, more chaotic, and certainly the flying squad and the other police forces knew very little about them. Former head of the Met's flying squad, Bob Cummings, now advises the UK security industry how to combat these villains. In some of the major cities in the UK where most of these robberies were happening, um, it became so dangerous for the guards to actually go about their job that the companies ended up lobbying the Home Office. As a result, the police and the cash industry began working together, sharing intelligence and developing new high-tech countermeasures. If a cash box is stolen, uh, the box is activated, notes are covered in either a dye or a coloured smoke which stains the note. In laboratories across the UK, forensic dyes and sprays are now microscopically encoded with a unique DNA barcode. This has made a big difference because what the police are able to do now is to actually pin that money down to where it was stolen.
In 2008, robbers armed with a handgun stole £20,000 from a security van in Blackburn before coldly shooting the guard in the leg. But when the gang forced open the cash box, an exploding dye pack stained the money with a unique DNA code. Shortly after the raid, the attackers began spending the money. But when staff alerted police to the dyed notes, analysis of the encoded DNA marker proved conclusively they came from the raid. The gang was sentenced to 50 years in prison. The next advancement is to design something which actually physically can't be used. And what the industry are now using is a glue solution, which, when the box is stolen, is spread all over the notes and bonds them into a wedge, rendering the money completely useless to the criminals. And it's not just the cash that's being targeted. DNA-style sprays are being used to brand the robbers themselves. Right, you get on the floor! Get on the floor! Between 2005 and 2007, a gang of jewel thieves carried out a series of armed raids throughout the country. On average, carrying out one robbery every two months. Changing their disguises from job to job. Get on the floor! But they finally made a critical error when they returned to the site of their first successful job. Jeremy France Jewelers in Winchester. This time, they were ready for them. Realizing the shop was being robbed again, staff activated anti-bandit smoke, causing the gang to panic. As they ran for the door, they were sprayed with a unique DNA marker called Smart Water. Smart Water's clear liquid spray is a forensic fingerprint invisible to the naked eye. But under a UV light, it provides crucial evidence to place the suspect at the scene of a crime. Step forward! The police had identified their suspects, but needed All proof. Right. When they raided their homes, they discovered 53 items of the stolen jewelry. Inside an airing cupboard, they found two handguns. And on one of them was the unique smart water spray that could have only come from Jeremy France jewelers. There was no hiding the jewel thieves' guilt. Criminals being what they are, as soon as they see that one uh, specific type of uh, the offence has been designed out, they'll move to somewhere else. And this is always a challenge for the industry to remain one step ahead. These microscopic markers may have put the criminals firmly on the back foot. But ever the innovators, some hone in on even more specialist targets. Monks, the scream is stolen at gunpoint from an Oslo museum. A group of armed robbers kick off with two extremely rare Fabergé eggs. From priceless artwork to rare diamonds, the enormous variety of valuables can be a lucrative market. And criminals don't always necessarily think big. In 2008, career crook Craig Townend decided to steal a collection of rare and valuable stamps. Craig Townend did a lot of research. He'd learnt enough in order to pass off as somebody that um, certainly had a working knowledge of stamps and the trade. Townend targeted a small stamp dealer in Devon, posing as a wealthy investor. Good I'm, uh, I'm Charles Deville. Oh, yes, of he took on a different identity. Um, he used the name Charles Deville. He found out the stamps were certainly worth an awful lot of money. But Townend had a problem. It was high summer and the area was teeming with tourist and potential witnesses. To steal the stamps, Townend had to rethink his plan. At that time, he, he made a decision that if he was going to get hold of the stamps, that he'd have to trace the businessman back to his home address. And to seize the collection, Townend decided that he and an accomplice would adopt another guise. We had a report in that two males had gone to an address 
that they'd purported to be police officers, that they brandished handguns, and tried to give the impression to the homeowner that they were police officers carrying out a raid. Whilst he was being restrained, the firearm that the assailant was holding was actually discharged. Then the raiders donned another costume, this time masks, before making off with the dealer's collection. In all, worth around £400,000. Townend thought he'd got away with it, but he still needed to sell on the goods, and targeting stamps had been his first mistake. Stamps can have very high value, so they are quite an obvious target, but actually the trade is really quite a tight-knit community, so it's actually far more difficult to pass them off than uh, you might think. But 200 miles away from the scene of the crime, Townend had reinvented himself into yet another fictional character, this time to try and sell on the stolen stamps. I'm from Stamps of Mayfair, just on Regent Street. He named himself the Laird of Glencairn and had gone to, to some effort in order to convince people he was a high-level, legitimate businessman. The town end didn't realise how identifiable the stamps would be. Colour, margins, postmarks, all of these things combine in an individual stamp to give it a fingerprint. But despite this, he did manage to secure a £10,000 sale. But immediately he made another foolish mistake. What name do you want it made out to, sir? Craig Townend. Craig Townend. When the dealer discovered the stamps were stolen, he reported the name to police, and it emerged that he had tried something similar before. Ten years earlier, Townend and an accomplice raided the York City Art Gallery and stole £1.3 million worth of fine art. He was caught red-handed as he posed as an art dealer trying to sell on the stolen works and sentenced to 15 years. Once released, he was soon up to his old tricks. After his first successful stamp sale, detectives were convinced Townend would return to the same North London dealer. And they were right. But this time, the police were ready. Craig Townend, you're under arrest, can you do say, on suspicion of armed robbery? His attempts to try and find a buyer, despite his fantastical disguises, meant his plan was doomed from the start. Craig Townend was sentenced to life behind bars. One way round this problem is to steal goods to order, and this can be an international market. A member of an Eastern European gang who were dubbed the Pink Panther Gang. It's just one of several high-profile heists carried out by the gang across the world. The infamous Pink Panther Gang specialise in stealing to order. Their criminal network of hundreds of jewel thieves have pinched millions of pounds worth of diamonds and jewellery from all over the world. From Paris to Tokyo, London to New York. It takes a greater degree of planning, preparation, criminal networking, and, and that puts that robbery team on a higher plane, really. And they're not the only gang to employ these tactics. More than £40 million worth of gems were stolen from Graff jewellers in central London. In 2009, two well-dressed men entered Graff jewellers on London's New Bond Street without a second glance. Once inside, they casually pulled out handguns and threatened staff. Within minutes, they had carried out the UK's biggest ever diamond raid, stealing nearly £40 million worth of jewels. As they fled, they were captured on a passerby's mobile phone. 
The gang were eventually caught, but the majority of the stolen jewellery has never been recovered, with detectives believing a mastermind behind the heist had already sold on the goods to a secured buyer. But this degree of planning is rare. Like stamp thief Craig Townend, most armed robbers are fantasists, not strategists, and they thrive on adrenaline. Once you start committing armed robbery, it becomes very addictive. It's like a class A drug. There's nothing better than walking into a place, being in there for three minutes and walking out with £30,000 in your pocket or in a bag. You know, it, it is a great feeling. And it's a power bus. But the need for the thrill and excitement is fundamentally at odds with the idea of the professional thief. The bravado, the impulsivity are incompatible with the characteristics of meticulousness, of, of self-restraint and control that are required to be a criminal mastermind. Renowned criminal psychologist Donna Youngs has spent 15 years analysing the motives and methods that underpin violent offending. One psychological variety of armed robbery is what we call armed robbery as heroic quest. For these offenders, um, they're not so much concerned about acting out the role of the consummate professional. Rather, what they're concerned about is the dramatic effect of their offence on the world, about having an impact, about proving their point, about being recognised. And for some, the need to be recognised can be too much to resist. Terry Smith was one of Britain's most notorious armed robbers. And when he was broken out of a prison van in 1984, he became one of the country's most wanted men. Smith had been in and out of jail for most of his adult life, but when he became a free man, his inside knowledge of armed robbery made him a leading authority on the subject. Joined now by Terry Smith, who was once an armed robber. And even a television celebrity. The police are very efficient and effective at nicking some of the robbers, not all of them. And then, um, from my point of view, I just hope that some of them do get away, but... But... <laughs> <laughs> not, not everybody will share that point No, of, of view, course, I but I mean, um, I'm a partisan member here, so... I just think uh, I'm wishing best of luck. He claimed that he was no longer in, involved in any criminality and was just an expert. In fact, he called himself a robologist. Terry Smith had made a great show of going straight. But in 2007, police started investigating a near-fatal armed robbery at Rayleigh Station in Essex, which bore all the hallmarks of one of his jobs. Police in Essex thinks that a man who was shot during an armed robbery... Two men attacked a security van, delivering money to a cash machine. Give us a box! Give us a box! Stay! Pushing 50, Smith had been out of prison for 12 years. But when witnesses began describing one of the robbers as having a distinctive limp, a retired detective was instantly reminded of an armed robber he had come across in the 1980s. The man's name was Terry Smith. Police investigating the Rayleigh offence were very keen to know what Smith had to say. Mr Smith, on the 25th of May, there was a serious incident at Rayleigh Station. Where were you that day? But even though Smith wasn't talking, they managed to find out everything they needed to know from the man himself. He'd actually written a number of books, uh, one of which was called The Art of Armed Robbery. That book actually proved to be highly relevant and a great source of intelligence for us. And really, we have to thank Mr. Smith for writing such a book because it was all about his modus operandi, told us about his family, his associates. In fact, he had photographs of his associates within the book. After more than a decade as a free man, Terry Smith was once again put under police surveillance. And when analysts studied the footage of Smith, 
Not only was his distinctive limp apparent, but so too was a unique side effect. Unable to bend his injured leg, Smith would get into a car head first. It matched exactly the strange gait of the man in CCTV footage of the crime scene. Detectives could now prove Terry Smith was indeed one of the robbers. He just couldn't stop committing armed robberies. He couldn't stop planning them. It was like a drug to him. There's no doubt about that. For Terry Smith, his addiction to robbery proved irresistible. And once again, he found himself behind bars. Terry Smith's TV appearances and the writing of his autobiography are really driven by the same underpinning psychological processes that drove his armed robbery behavior. They're driven by the same need to demonstrate his prowess and his ability to demand attention. They are the functional equivalent of the dysfunctional armed, armed robberies that actually he was continuing to commit at the same time. But for some criminals, the thrill is not in the act itself, but in honing their skills and outsmarting the police altogether. Learn from people who have already been caught, and you see what mistakes they made, and try not to make them yourself. You've got to be aware of you know, what the police are doing and, and what they're coming up with in order to combat you. And you've always got to try and be ahead of them. You've always got to try and outwit them. So how do detectives take down the ones who think they're untouchable? Londoner Danny Speed was the master tactician behind one of the most highly organized teams of criminals the Flying Squad had ever encountered. His planning and preparation for an armed robbery was way beyond what we'd seen before. Between 2007 and 2010, Speed orchestrated a series of violent raids across East Anglia and the southeast, netting nearly half a million pounds. He was so adept at planning and executing these raids, detectives dubbed him Mr. Meticulous. They were strategically aware criminals who planned a, an armed robbery, almost like perhaps the police would plan a policing operation. So that's what's making it difficult. You're almost going up against someone who's using very similar tactics to you. For many in the criminal underworld, Speed was the man to turn to for advice. He became almost a consultant for armed robbers and a consultant for armed robbery. In January 2008, Speed planned his most brazen raid yet. The gang hid a nationwide building society in the quaint market town of Holt in Norfolk. Quick, quick, come on, come on, hurry up! Time, time! But this time, after stealing 80,000 pounds, instead of making their getaway, they had the nerve to check into the hotel down the road, where they could sit back and admire their work. Um, I'll have a beer, please, mate. Make that too, please, mate. By now, I think he was enjoying rubbing the police's nose in it. He saw himself as being so well-schooled and so clever that he, he was almost daring himself on the next offence he committed. And for their next offence, the gang stole £47,000 while dressed in camouflage gear to blend in with American servicemen in Mildenhall, Suffolk, home to a US military airbase. They're thinking, if we're seen by anyone, they just think we're visiting forces. You've got to have some front to do that. Although forensics had identified the gang behind the raids, there was insufficient evidence to convict them. So the elite flying squad were called in to take them down once and for all. We'd look at what sort of methods are used linking all the offences. You want to find out where they live, what vehicles they're using, who their associations are, 
so you'd use covert tactics around that. But it wasn't just Speed's ability to plan a job that set him apart. He and his team had the ability to outsmart even the most sophisticated police tactics. From the start, it was a complete nightmare. I never encountered anti-surveillance techniques by any team that we targeted before. They knew the police tactics. They knew what we'd do. They knew what really what a surveillance team looked like. We had trained officers from the surveillance wing who were excellent at what they do, and they were getting compromised. He enjoyed dragging them around. And even knowing that they were under observation, it didn't stop the gang from committing more robberies. But detectives were about to get a break. Surveillance teams had managed to identify their next target. This time, the flying squad would be lying in wait for them. If you don't take a chance with them, then you might never get an opportunity again. And then they go up to another echelon of criminality and they become exceptionally difficult for any one police organisation to take on. Suspects out of view. All units stand by. Suddenly we get this horrible moment. What's your problem? What are you up Oi. to? Compromise. Hey, what do you Compromise. Realising he was being watched, Danny Speed had once again outsmarted the police operation. The flying squad had missed their chance. To get that close, to then lose it, was devastating. After such a close shave, the gang went to ground. And Speed left the country. But he still couldn't resist bragging to the authorities. Hey, your mates are on to me. Excuse me? Tell him to stop it, will you? They're rubbish at it. Thanks, sir. But it wasn't long before the gang were up and running again. They obviously need money because they're out robbing again. It's great news because we're back in. But so far, all covert operations had failed. The flying squad were forced to rethink their tactics. We thought we'd have to go maybe one step further and think outside the box and think of what else we could do. So they decided to put a listening probe in Danny Speed's car. What's up? Listen, yes, I've got some job coming up in the next couple of weeks, if you're interested. And immediately they got the breakthrough they needed. It's quite amazing that a guy of his calibre would just drop his guard. Yes. Now the flying squad were one step ahead. After an 18-month investigation, Detectives were finally ready to take down Speed and his gang. But for once, Mr. Meticulous was running late. Speed had actually overslept, which is so ironic. His guard's down there at that point because he's not looking. He's, he's just in his car and he's going like a bat out of hell to get there. Positive ID on Speed. All units stand by. Suspects are changing into blacks. All right, call in. All units, strike, strike, strike. Tell me I ain't right here. Danny Speed, the man who thought he was untouchable, had finally met his match. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Weighing up the risk of, say, imprisonment or being captured is, is something that I think doesn't enter the mind of 90% of criminals. If you actually sat down and thought about what you were doing and what the result could be, and let's face it, you're looking at, in my case, you're looking at 20 years for armed robbery, you wouldn't go out and do it. Nowadays, you can't. You're putting your life on the line and you're putting your liberty on the line for absolute, what is a petty amount of cash, and you're looking at bundles of years in jail. Tough policing, high prison sentences and advances in technology mean that for many armed robbers, the risks far outweigh the rewards. But there are some criminals still willing to risk it all for one massive payday.
they've put you in a place at prison where you're mixing with all other armed robbers who will be telling each other the same thing. Well, this is us for life. We're not fit for anything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this big job when I get out and retire. So you're always chasing the big job that will allow you to give up armed robbery. To get their hands on their retirement fund, some are willing to go to dramatic lengths. In 2000, in a scene straight out of a James Bond movie, thieves raided the Millennium Dome in London using a speedboat, smoke bombs and a JCB. They were after a collection of diamonds worth an estimated 350 million pounds. Amongst them was one of the largest and rarest diamonds in the world, the De Beers Millennium Star. But there was to be no Hollywood ending for these thieves. Armed police at the Dome in London have foiled what would have been the biggest robbery anywhere in the world. On a tip-off, the real diamonds had been substituted with fakes, and over a hundred armed officers were lying in wait, ready to catch the criminals in the act. But with the stakes so high, some will use the most sinister tactics to get their hands on their ultimate prize. Tiger kidnapping is the name given to a robbery where the gangs will target the families of an individual who holds the keys to the valuables within a premises. And the classic example in recent years is the depot robbery down in Tombridge. In 2005, a gang started to plot the biggest heist in British history. Their target was the Securitas depot in Tombridge, Kent. Inside the maximum security fortress was around 200 million pounds in cash. It's not somewhere you can just knock and walk in. But every detail of its inner workings were being fed to the gang by an inside agent, Emir Hussani using a pinhole camera stuck in his belt. He filmed the inside of the depot. But even with this information, the gang had no way past the high-level security. Who could turn up and afford them access to that depot without question? To get inside, the gang had decided on a ruthless solution. They planned to abduct the depot manager, Colin Dixon, and his family. First, they set about monitoring the Dixon's movements. She's been in all day. It was quite extraordinary the lengths they went to, where he lives, what car he drives, everything that would lead them to be able to get hold of him at any time. They even went as far as secretly recording the family home. They had actually set up the camera, woven it into a handbag to go and make an inquiry by knocking on the door with an excuse that they were looking for somebody else. When you consider that someone's looking at you and your family for the purpose of greed only, they're quite happy to kidnap and traumatise a family, a child. And th that is beyond it. After six months of planning and armed with every detail of the family's movements, the gang put their plan into operation. Disguised as policemen, they first kidnapped Colin Dixon. Would you mind stepping out of the vehicle, please? Right. Now, if you cooperate, nobody would get hurt. Do you understand? Having secured the depot manager, the gang turned their attentions to his wife and young child. Hello. Evening, Mrs. Dixon. Can I help you? It's your husband. He's been involved in a traffic accident. We're here to date you down your hospital. A policeman's come to the door. A person they're supposed to trust has then taken them away. You got any ID? It's in the boot, love. I've never heard of anything like it in my 
nearly 30 years as a police officer. Emily! Uh, Emily! Uh, At gunpoint, Lynn Dixon and her young child were driven to a remote farm where her husband was being held hostage. Emily staff are they calling? Do you think we're kidding you? Emily! He's asked all sorts of questions about the inside of the depot. If you don't cooperate, I am going to shoot you and your family. Please, I'll tell you what you need to know. So he now knows that he's got no option. Come on, get him up. Come on, get him up. Come on, let's go. Come on. The chap on the control room recognises his manager straight away. With that question, let's him in. Plan is now working. They mean business, no doubt. A number of the employees were convinced that they were going to be killed. Leaving the hostages locked in cages, the gang got away with 53 million pounds. The terrifying ordeal of the family caught up in Britain's biggest ever robbery. We know for a fact that this is organised crime at its top level. Andy, what do you got? How much? This was unprecedented. We had never come across this before. We had to conduct forensic examinations. We had 14 witnesses who had been kidnapped in the depot, all of whom needed to be interviewed. But stealing 53 million pounds is one thing. Getting away with it is another. Who would dare to pull off such an audacious crime? This must be an upper echelon robbery team. It must be to organize this, to go to these great lengths, to steal so much money. But there was one thing about the kidnappings that puzzled detectives. They've shown their faces. They must have been disguised in some way. They must have been. What about prosthetic masks or disguises of that nature? Well, that's a bit mission impossible. So stealing 53 million quid. With forces up and down the country on high alert, it wasn't long before they had their first lead. Makeup artist Michelle Hogg. Who's she? Apparently she made up a few guys to look like policemen. Policemen? Yeah. Sleep with me. And when her home was raided, detectives discovered in her wheelie bin an Aladdin's cave of prosthetics. That was an absolute bombshell for us. It was fantastic. Although Hogg admitted making up the men, she knew nothing of their identity or what they were planning. But the investigation was gathering pace. Two vehicles involved in the heist were discovered burnt out. They were registered to local car dealer Stuart Royal. Then a van was recovered, which was linked to an employee of Royal, Lee Russia. Inside was a ballistics vest, a submachine gun, and 1.3 million pounds in cash. The cracks were appearing. These weren't your upper echelon armed robbers. They were a car dealer from Maystone and one of his drivers. When police raided Lee Rush's home, along with a whole host of evidence, they found a hand-drawn map of the depot and the surveillance footage of the Dixon's home. The dreadful at covering the tracks and what they were going to do afterwards. Leaving a map of the inside of the depot in your home. You know, that is just unbelievable. Police started to round up the suspects. But who was the ringleader behind the operation? One name kept cropping up, Lee Murray. Lee Murray was a celebrity cage fighter, known very much in the southeast of London. We had the names of Paul Allen that came in, who was very much Lee Murray's right-hand man. Here, boys, listen, I've got this job coming on. It could be massive. We can link him to the Kent gang because he has trained in mixed martial arts with Lee Russia. A definite link between these two. With the gang's litany of mistakes growing all the time, the most devastating evidence would come from Murray himself. In the weeks prior to the heist, 
Murray's Ferrari had been impounded after a road accident. Boss, you're not going to believe this. They found a mobile phone. You're going to want to hear what's on it. Probably takes one of us, with a van. Literally, it's going to be a matter of seconds, isn't it? He recorded a five-minute slot with Lee Rush, and they are clearly discussing planning for the robbery. But just days after the Securitas raid, Murray and Allen had fled to Morocco. With no extradition treaty with the UK, they thought they'd got away with it. They were living the life of luxury. What they didn't bargain on was that we would chase them, and we did. With the help of the Moroccan authorities, Paul Allen was sent back to the UK. The ruthless gang who had terrorized the Dixon family was sentenced to over 150 years behind bars. But by now, Murray had claimed Moroccan citizenship, making it impossible for him to be brought back. With his millions, he thought he was untouchable, but he was wrong. Murray was put on trial in Morocco, where he was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in jail. They didn't realize that by stealing so much money, how much interest it would stir up in the public and how much the public would react to that. That's where they went wrong. They nicked too much. Every day, around 1.4 billion pounds is transported around the UK. Money needs to be moved. Until we do away with cash completely, then money needs to be moved around and it will always be vulnerable. And it's these vulnerabilities that armed robbers will continue to exploit. It is a game of risk, which some criminals, no matter how high the stakes become, will keep on playing. There is never such a thing as a perfect robbery, as history has shown. There are always the weak links. There are always flaws in their plan. The trick is the police have got to control those individuals and, and, and be one step ahead. Good evening. There have been fresh allegations tonight about the circumstances surrounding...